Dumelang. Welcome to Face the Nation. My name is Clement Magnatella. It's great to have you with us here on SABC News. On the show tonight, the IEC insists that there is nothing untoward about approaching the Constitutional Court to appeal an order which cleared the path for the former President Jacob Zuma to be deployed to Parliament by the MK party, even though they have not seen the full judgment yet, giving reasons for the Electoral Court's order. So, is the Commission jumping the gun? Or is this an important move for constitutional clarity on the matter? The IEC's CEO, Sai Mamabolo, joins us on Face the Nation tonight. Also on the show, why is the Electoral Court delaying in delivering the full judgment when they know how urgent this matter is? We've seen other delays in the delivery of judgments on other matters. So what's going on? The Houting Judge President, Dustin Mlambo, will speak to us. And then later, what is SARS doing to hold accountable wealthy individuals who are underestimating their own provisional taxes? There's a lot of dishonesty out there. So how closely is SARS monitoring NGOs, trusts? Because some are used as vehicles for money laundering. The SARS Commissioner, Edward Kisveta, is going to be with us tonight. That's Face the Nation this evening. So the IEC has decided to approach the Constitutional Court to appeal the Electoral Court's order setting aside the Commission's decision to bar President Jacob Zuma, the former president, from standing as a parliamentary candidate for the Umkonto West Caesar Party. Remember, the IEC used Section 47.1e of the Constitution to uphold an objection to Jacob Zuma's candidacy by a citizen. Now, that section of the Constitution bars individuals that are sentenced to prison for longer than 12 months without the option of a fine from becoming MPs. But Zuma's lawyers successfully argued in court a number of issues, and we're still yet to know which ones the Electoral Court was convinced by. But they argued that the remission that President Cyril Ramaphosa granted cancelled that sentence, not forgive it, because it wasn't a pardon. So because of the remission, the sentence was reduced from 15 months to three months. They also argued that the IEC doesn't have the right to implement Section 47 of the Constitution and decide on who can or can't be an MP. The IEC, on the other hand, argued that the effect of the remission of sentence does not change the fact that the court imposed a sentence of 15 months. So the decision by the president to grant him remission doesn't matter. Here's what's important. The full judgment is still not out. The Electoral Court only released an order which effectively cleared the path for the former president to appear on the ballot on that parliamentary list for the MK. So we don't know on what basis the Electoral Court has issued this order. We still don't have the full reasons. Eight days later. Yes, this is not unusual, but this is an urgent matter and this delay has led to an unintended information vacuum about a matter that is so important and highly political. And the IEC has decided it's not going to wait for those reasons. It will approach the Constitutional Court for clarity. Here's how the IEC explained their reason for going to the highest court, even without knowing the full reasons for the Electoral Court's order. Did the Commission go beyond its scope of authority in invoking Section 47.1e. We have no clarity as a country on that aspect at the moment. Two, did Commissioner Love prejudge the issue to extend that she ought to have recused themself, herself rather? We don't know whether the statement that he made in response to a media question did in fact constitute prejudging the issue. So is the IEC jumping the gun here by appealing an order without knowing the full reasons for why that order was made? They don't know which arguments were upheld or dismissed, but it's important that there is constitutional clarity on this matter.
because that affects the IEC's powers in as far as Section 47 of the Constitution should be applied and what remission of sentence actually means. But then again, who says the Electoral Court based its argument on this argument, its decision? What if they were more convinced by the argument of bias, for instance, on the part of the IEC Commissioner Janet Love? Either way, I think it's still going to be important for the IEC to get clarity on whatever argument the Electoral Court relied on for the benefit of knowing how to manage such matters in the future. The unfortunate thing here for me is that the Constitutional Court is again put in a corner to decide an issue that is so polarizing. But I suppose on the other hand, it's also fortunate for us to live in a constitutional democracy where such recourse is available. The other unfortunate thing is that people are already prejudging the Constitutional Court's handling of this matter based on how it's handled Zuma's contempt of court, which led to him being sent to prison. But I have to say, the biggest unfortunate thing for me is that judges who heard this matter between Zuma and the IEC have still not delivered the full judgment, knowing very well how urgent this matter is. Even the Deputy Chief Justice, Mandi Samaya, said recently during the JSC interviews that the country is waiting for the judgment. Well, I can tell you that the country is waiting with bated breath for those reasons. That's what she told the acting Electoral Court Judge Sina Yakub in an interview with the JSC for the seat in that court. So what's the delay? The vacuum has so far been filled by speculation, some of which is unfounded and perpetuates disinformation about the credibility of the IEC as an institution of democracy. It's continued the sense of uncertainty about what's expected before and after the elections. It's continued the questions people are asking about the so-called bias of the Constitutional Court. Whatever the Constitutional Court decides on this matter can only enrich our understanding of the law and more importantly, strengthen our democratic processes. So why are we seeing such delays in the delivery of judgment? I think it's unfortunate. And here's the question I'm asking you tonight. Is the IEC appealing an order without knowing the full reasons justifiable? But also, what is your opinion on the court delays in the release of full judgments for urgent matters? Please send us a WhatsApp voice note right now on 078 459 1897. That number is on your screen right now. Remember to tell us your name and where you are sending the voice note from. And please keep it at 30 seconds. Alternatively, you can send us a tweet at Face the Nation SABC. Now, the IEC has confirmed that the former president Jacob Zuma's face will be displayed on the voting ballot besides the name and the emblem of the MK party. The Electoral Commission updated the media on its progress with regard to the preparation towards the May elections, which are less than 50 days away, believe it or not. Zuma's picture as an identifier on the ballot comes after the Electoral Court overturned the decision of the IEC to bar him from contesting the polls on a 2021 sentence for contempt of court. The IEC has meanwhile taken the court's order for clarity at the Constitutional Court. Let's bring in now the IEC Chief Electoral Officer, Sai Mamabolo, who joins us now via, uh, via Zoom. Mr. Mamabolo, thank you so much for making time for us. Welcome to Face the Nation. Why have you decided to approach the Constitutional Court before you've had sight of the full judgment and the reasons for the order? Um, good, good evening. The, it is important that a matter of such substantial public interest, uh, the clarity that is procured um, on an expeditious uh, basis, because the powers of the Commission, insofar as they relate to the enforcement of Section 47.1e, are in question here. So it is important, therefore, uh, before the election, that that clarity is sought and procured, and that um, the voting public know ahead of the election whether, in fact, the commission acted incorrectly by invoking that section or, or not. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the first issue. The second issue, which is of great import, 
is the fact that uh, you do not um, direct the the appeal against the reasons in the judgment. You 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 direct the appeal against the orders of court. Of course, when you have reasons, it is much easier. It facilitates uh, decision making and so on. Yet there is nothing untoward, legally speaking, that precludes the commission from approaching the court uh, even without without reasons. In the event the reasons um, come our way, we'll look at those and see whether there's a need to amend the papers that we filed before the Constitutional Court. And remember, uh, appeal of this nature, um, which is also a direct um, application to the Concord, are duty bound, um, sorry, are time bound. So there is no scope for delay. You've got to do it expeditiously, especially because you are also asking for an expired, uh, expired, um, um, expired uh, hearing. Mm -hmm. So you, you, the, the, there's no scope um, uh, to dither. You, we needed to deal with the matter um, yeah. as quickly as we could to minimize pressure that may be visited upon the Concord itself. Yeah, but, but there's no guarantee that the Concord itself is going to hear the matter uh, within this week or let's say next week. I mean, the Concord itself is dealing uh, with the issues of the backlog. So would it, it have been wise to at least wait for the full reasons and then when you approach the court, you have a, a coherent and more comprehensive appeal that challenges the reasons that the electoral court based its order on or are you approaching the court because you don't think you're going to have the full judgment from the electoral court within the coming, let's say, five days? Look, we, we, we have the greatest respect from the electoral court. We think it's a, it's a very competent court, capable jurist there with a lot of experience, capable professors uh, who have proven themselves in their own trade. So... We, we, we do not want to diminish the uh, uh, esteem of the, of, the, of the electoral court. We, we have the most, um, utmost respect for the court. Um, we do not wish to place them under pressure. In fact, we are aware that the, their load at the moment is quite heavy. There are um, uh, a lot of cases before them that they need to hear, determine, and so on. So we, 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 we are not in any way trying to put pressure on anyone, but we are also alive to the fact that the Concord may elect not to hear the matter at all. Um, the Concord may decide to say it's not urgent um, and they'll hear it in time. Um, the, all those possibilities are real, so nothing can be taken for granted here. But that can never preclude uh, the Commission seeking clarity on such weighty constitutional matters. Mm -hmm. I, I want us to look at one of the arguments that were made in court. Uh, the former president's lawyers argued that you don't have the authority to implement Section 47.1e um, of the Constitution because that would be an overreach on your part and, and, and then you are tinkling on that principle of separation of powers. Have you ever as the IEC had to implement Section 47 before? Of course, the, the, the framework and the supporting uh, regulations and so on operates, operate on the basis that uh, we are competent to enforce Section 47.1e. For instance, the authorized representative of the political party, when they submit the list of candidates, part of the declaration they make is that every candidate on the list is qualified to stand in terms of the constitution, mm. uh, uh, pertinently uh, section 47 and section 106 of the constitution. So that shows you that we've always Hubbard uh, under the um, 
the the impression that we it is within our realm and scope of authority to enforce yeah. uh, that section. Upon reflection as the IEC, when you look at what one of your commissioners, Janet Love, said about the former president not being able to stand for a parliamentary position because of the criminal record, what reflections have you had on that? I know you indicated earlier today that you don't think there's enough evidence for her to resign from the position, but in hindsight, could she... Could she have handled things differently and responded to that initial question differently? Clement, the, uh, the commissioner was addressing a hypothetical uh, situation and said if um, there were a, a, a situation such as this were to arise, uh, then the provision of law is as follows. Um, now, I don't think that can ever amount to prejudging yeah. a, a factual situation that subsequently arose. But again, as you know, it's a matter that was canvassed uh, quite uh, enthusiastically yeah. in the, in the uh, proceedings of the Electoral Court, and it's subject of our yeah. um, uh, leave to appeal. So mm. we really have got to give space to the relevant uh, judicial forums to yeah. evaluate and, and I hear um, that, all those issues. I hear that, Mr. Mamabola, and I'm asking in hindsight because I think as the IEC, you, you, it's not enough to be independent. Um, it's, you, you have to also be seen to be independent. So managing the perception of bias is important. When Janet, La, uh, Janet Love made that statement, the IEC had not opened the period for the public to lodge objections regarding the candidate lists that were submitted uh, by parties for parliament. Couldn't she have said, we'll deal with that matter when we are screening the candidates against what the law requires? Because that way, you're also managing perception, which is also important. And I'm not trying to suggest that as the IEC, you must cower to people. But, but I'm saying you understand how polarizing this environment is when you have got direct questions like that, where decisions about particular individuals have not been made, whether the law says they will stand or not, is it not best to say the IEC is going to go through a process that is going to look at the candidates and a decision will be made at the right time? No, fair enough, Clement, fair enough. But in this present case, I think the... The comment, really, um, in, in that media, media briefing was a statement of law um, uh, to say this is what the law provides. Um, and there can never be anything wrong, really, with stating up front what the legal provisions are as they relate to a particular hypo hypothetical reality. The IEC's CEO, Sam Mamabulo, thank you so much for joining us this evening on Face the Nation. After the break, Gauteng Judge President Dustin Mlambo will chat to us about the delay in the delivery of judgments. We'll also touch with him on the conduct of some of our judicial officers. Stay with us here on Face the Nation. Welcome back to Face the Nation. Now, the wheels of justice turn slowly. We've all often heard this phrase, at one point or another. This is a phrase that's often heard because litigants frequently wait years before a hearing date for a matter is allocated. Now, the Gauteng Judge President Dustin Blamo joins us in studio to talk about these kind of delays and how uh, they are dealing with them. Uh, Judge President, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Welcome to Face the Nation. Thanks for having me, Mr. Miatella. We are talking this evening about a conundrum that's been caused by the delay in the delivery of the full judgment on the matter involving the former president and the IEC. But there are other matters as well where we've seen the delay in the delivery of judgments. What's going on? What is the case? Well, I think uh, I listened to your interview with uh, Mr. Mamabulo. Yeah. Let me start with situations like that. There are matters that come urgently mm. to courts where judges do not rush into giving reasons. But uh, there are situations where once they've applied their minds and head argument, then they 
make up their minds which way they're going to go. They can issue an order. It happens in very limited circumstances. Mm -hmm. And this matter that you're talking about is one of those matters which come urgently and an order, an indication from the court is required. So the order will be handed down to be followed by reasons. And uh, because it happens mostly in matters that are urgent, mm -hmm. the reasons do not take very long to come that say why was that order arrived at. Mm -hmm. That's the one aspect. The other aspect is the general one, where matters are hid, no order is handed down, but the whole judgment is reserved for some time, and then everything is handed down at some later stage. Now, I don't know one, whether you want me to go into that aspect yeah. as well. well. We'll get into that in a moment. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to understand is, in instances where the matter is urgent, yes. and the order is delivered, mm -hmm. is it justifiable to deliver an order and release an order and then wait two weeks almost before you can release the full judgment. Understanding very well how urgent the matter is and particularly the reason so that the IEC knows what are the constitutional limitations and how, how do they deal with an issue. I'm not going to, under the, to answer the justifiable mm. part of it, but I can assure you that the judges who sat in that matter are working very hard to produce their reasons mm -hmm. for that order. It happens. Remember, they've got other work. It's not that once they've had the matter, they've handed down the order, then they don't have anything else mm -hmm. and focus on that. They've got to attend to other things. And I think that's the context that's always lost when people look at why some of these judgments uh, and reasons are delayed. There's a context to it. The support that judges get, I know that the electoral court has no research support whatsoever. So you're relying on those judges to do their own research to actually arrive at cogent reasons. And why I don't think- they, Why don't the, they don't have that support? Why don't they have that support? Mm. Um, the electoral court is a court that's capacitated from judges from other courts, right? So it doesn't have its own self-standing capacity. Like that matter was heard in the Houghton division. Mm. I had to give them my chambers and a court mm. for them to. So they don't have that support. So maybe one of them, probably Justice Zondi, would use some of the researchers in the SCA. But those resources are stretched. I mean, I think at the last check, they had not more than three researchers servicing 24 judges. Three On, researchers. Uh, as we speak, judges. as we speak. So those things need to be factored in, Mr. Miyatela, to say, don't just blame the judges. They want to give you a well-reasoned judgment. So allow them that space without pressurizing them mm -hmm. to give you those reasons. What are you doing as leaders of, as the Houting Judge President, I imagine the Chief Justice as well, has got to intervene in some way. I mean, when you've got three researchers helping over 20 judges, of course we're going to get to a point where judgments are delayed. Yeah. What is being done to resolve that? I, I may be wrong on the three, but I think that uh, I'm relying on a conversation I had recently. But it's a few of them. It's, it's a few I of them. I think the Chief Justice it's, has confirmed Yes, it's it. a few of them, yeah. And I think there are vacancies as well, you know. But we have discussed this. I know the CJ has engaged uh, the President to actually take seriously our resources constraints. Gauteng relies on 12 researchers for not less than 85 judges. That's a fact, isn't it? Hmm. So sometimes we look at what other options are available at sourcing research intents that don't come at government expense that help us. And that goes a long way into relieving the pressure on our small research units. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we, we, as I say, the, 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 the Chief Justice has engaged the President to say they must relook overall mm -hmm. our resourcing, right? Because we need to continue giving quality justice. And you see that in the judgments that we will give you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there, there are concerns that have been raised in the past about the quality of the judgments that are coming from some mm -hmm. of the judges. Yes. They are simply poor. Well, I agree. I've seen some of them, some of those very poor poor judgments, but uh, mm. that, that's a, di a discussion for another day why it's like that. Mm. Because people have been interviewed and they've been appointed, having gone through that public interview process from mm. the JSC, that they are fit and proper 
to become judges. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm interested, uh, Judge President, if you can help us understand, because uh, a lot of South Africans are trying to understand what the legal parameters are. Can you even go to the Constitutional Court, for instance, to appeal an order when you have not looked at the full reasons? Because the IEC says, we are working on the agency of the matter, and hopefully when the full reasons come, we can just amend whatever needs to be amended. But is it possible for the Concord to hear matters that are being appealed based on the order without the reasons why that order was made? And wouldn't that be encroaching on the lower courts if they do that? No, I don't think the Concord will hear the matter without reasons. The reasons will come. Regard to what the IEC has done as a placeholder, mm. right, to say we are giving notice that we want to appeal this order. We're still waiting for the reasons. And they will supplement that leave to appeal application once the reason comes, because then they will ex say exactly why they are appealing. Who knows? Once they get the reasons, they may decide we have no case. Let's withdraw. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's what they'll do. I'm just saying those are all the variables that could happen. Yeah. That's why I say regard it as a placeholder. Mm. Let's talk broadly about these delays that we've seen. There are some judges that have been impeached because they have delayed in delivering their judgments. We don't have to get specifically into those cases, but just broadly speaking, this challenge, and you're saying that there are vacancies, the Chief Justice has also indicated that there must be some kind of intervention. How does that impact on the judiciary? And how do you think it impacts also on people that are seeking justice? Yeah. Well, no judge has yet been impeached. There are processes that are still ongoing. Yeah regarding that aspect, yeah. right? But it's a problem. If you look at the reserve judgment report that the Chief Justice releases quarterly, you'll see how many judges reserve judges for a lot longer than they are supposed to. And sometimes the period you see there is a shocking period, right? So it's something that we're working at as the heads of courts, talking to our judges. But as I said, context is very important. Look at Gauteng. In Gauteng, it's easy to finish a term with 20 reserve judgments. It's very easy. And you have the recess to write, and to write those judgments. But you need to use that recess to also prepare for the next term. So without the necessary support, and judges don't have time away from other work to prepare judgments once they've had matters. You finish a, a very complex matter this week, you get into another matter next week. Mm. That's the nature of the beast. Do we right? need more judges? Do we need more judges? We've made those, uh, those suggestions, no, those proposals very strong in Gauteng that we need not less than 15 more judges in Gauteng. Just in Gauteng? Yeah, just in Gauteng. And, and thank you so much for, for that clarification. You're right about impeachment because yeah. that process is still underway. It's still ongoing, yeah. um, But if you, when you look at those specific two judges uh, that are being held accountable for these judgments that are slow in being delivered, sometimes you don't know if it's just an issue of no interest because, yes, there are legitimate reasons where there are no enough researchers, there are not enough people helping them out. Mm. But in some instances, you've got judges that are simply not doing their work. I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> it's possible. But sometimes judges will come to the head of court and say, JP, mm. I got these heavy matters that you gave me. I'm busy with their judgments. I'm not going to be able to deliver them within a specified time. I need more time. Are you able to release me? from normal allocation so that I can finish that one and that one. Mm -hmm. We have those opportunities. And uh, there are a number of judges who make use of that, but that puts more strain on other judges because that means the work that's supposed to be done by judge, judge must be uh, allocated to other judges. But in the norm, you know, what I say as head of court is, when we go into recess, like the long recess, which is five weeks or, or, or six weeks, mm -hmm. It's not a holiday for a judge. It's recess for you to cock a moya, as I say. Mm -hmm. But look at what you're owing and write. Not, don't sit back and do nothing, mm -hmm. right? And then when you come to the next term, at least you've made inroads. Mm -hmm. You go into recess owing five judgments. You come back, you've delivered all five or you've delivered but four. But then you haven't rested. Well, you're, you're resting in the sense that you're just doing judgments. Yeah. You're not doing any new work, okay. so to speak. I get you know? it. Yeah. 
What other options are you exploring? Because in the constitutional court, because of their black log challenges, the Chief Justice got to a point where he even explored a scenario where you have former justices come and help. They're not going to hear the matters, but they're going to help with writing memorandums and then they send them to the sitting justices. Um, my understanding is that the Constitutional Court and the Chief Justice have since abandoned that program because they realize that there are not enough former justices that can assist in the program. Would that be an option that you explore where you bring in the former judges to somehow assist in some way or another? Not to hear the matters or make the decisions, but to just help with looking at, at the points at hand. Well, look, if a matter is got to be decided by judges, it's got to be decided by the judges who sit and hear that matter. Right, I think that's a principle we need to, to embrace, right? Now, let me not discuss that option that the Constitutional Court tried, right? But the fact is, is how you arrange your hearing docket and how you deal with it. Like, the Concord deals with everything and bank. That is everything. Every single petition that goes there, each justice must look at. Mm -hmm. It's a court of general jurisdiction now. Clearly, it's going to be swamped. It is swamped. But it's a question of how we as heads of courts, how the CJ, the DCJ, look at what's happening and decide how those 11 judges deal with what comes and how do they deal with matters where they grant leave, mm -hmm. whether they hear them or whether they refer them to other courts so that they create more room for them to just deal with those matters that require their attention. I mean, I'm a fan of the US Supreme Court and a lot of people criticize it, but if you look at how that court utilizes its power and jurisdiction to hear appeals, it's very sparing that any matter that goes there mm. will be heard. Yeah. Mm. As we wrap up, I, I want to ask about the conduct of judicial officers. How concerned should we be about the conduct of judicial officers, the judges that are on the bench? Uh, we've had instances where judges have questioned the racial makeup of legal teams, whether rightly or wrongly. Uh, there's another judge who recently said, you know, black judges are always late. Another judge was removed from a case after he took a break while a witness was testifying during proceedings. I mean, these conducts are quite concerning when we are watching them as South Africans. Yeah. Well, I don't think, um, to, I'm talking generally mm. from what I'm aware of, I don't think you have much to worry about the conduct of, uh, of judges in particular. I'm talking judges. You know, there are specific instances that you refer to now and then. Mm. By the way, I don't think that bars a judge from questioning the racial makeup of who appears before him, right? As long as it doesn't go into his reasons for the, the matter that has been argued by those legal teams. But we as judges rely on the professions to feed into the profession, into mm -hmm. the bench, mm -hmm. onto the bench. So it has to be our concern to say who appears before us, who gets the experience mm. to deal with these matters who can then raise their hands and say we want to become judges so any judge is uh, uh, within his rights to question that right as i say not to put them in their reasons but mm. you can question them i introduced a briefing patterns project because i was concerned that there are certain areas that are reserved for white male advocates yet there are Black advocates, female advocates who go through the same universities, why mm -hmm. are they not getting that work? And we're looking at all those people to come to the bench. But overall, yes, there are instances where judges make a comment they should, be, they should not have made, which is an unguarded comment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, if there's an apology that comes thereafter, that's the end of the matter. Yeah. I don't think anyone should worry about uh, sporadic instances like that. Judges are not robots. They don't human go through beings. this in a robotic. They're human mm. beings. Mm. Sometimes what happens in front of them provokes them, you know? Yeah, and as you say, as long as when they realize they've done something wrong, they come and apologize yes. and they yes. learn from their mistakes. Yes. Houting Judge President Dustin Mlambo, thank you so much for coming to Face the Nation tonight. Thank you, Ms. Mignotta. We'll be back after the break. The SARS Commissioner is going to be joining us after the break. We'll be talking about what SARS is doing to go after the wealthy, some of whom are actually underestimating um, their taxes. And what are they doing about NGOs and some of the companies that in fact are, and even trusts, that are now beginning to be vehicles 
for money laundering. That's a conversation coming up. Stay with us. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We've been asking you a question this evening, whether you think that the IEC is justified for approaching the Constitutional Court, even when they haven't seen uh, the full judgment from the Electoral Court. But we're also asking what you make of the judgments that are being delayed, particularly on urgent matters. We've asked you to send us your WhatsApp voice notes on 078 459 Let's take a listen to some of what you have to say. Hi, Clement. Uh, this is Mchim Kulu from Centurion. The wording of the Constitution uh, there in Section 47, Subsection 1, disqualifies, and I quote, anyone sentenced to more than 12 months, close quote. Therefore, whether you end up serving three months or whatever, it shouldn't matter. Uh, and it's irresponsible, I'm afraid, for the con court, for the electoral court to delay this matter so unnecessarily. Thank you. Uh, greetings, Mr. Manyatel. It's Sandy here from uh, Peter Maisbeck, Pine Town. Uh, I think it's quite unfortunate that we find ourselves as a country in this position, but uh, I commend the IEC for going to the Constitutional Court so that uh, our election results are not called into questions, there are appeals and all that. So I think it's better we deal with everything now so that we can have smooth elections. All right, thank you very much for your WhatsApp voice notes. Now, the South African Revenue Service has announced its preliminary revenue collection for the 2023-2024 financial year with a surplus of about 10 billion rand. SARS has collected a gross tax revenue of over 2 trillion rand. Now, the SARS commissioner, Edward Kisveta, has been at the helm since 2019 for a five-year term. His term was set to end at the end of this month. President Cyril Ramaphosa has extended that tenure beyond the end of his term as the revenue collector. He joins us now in studio. Welcome to Face the Nation, uh, Commissioner. Good evening, Clement. Good evening to you. Um, I never thought that when I see you again after our last engagement, you'll still be the commissioner. But as I said to you earlier, who says no to I, President Cyril I Ramaphosa? I never thought so, and I probably need the name of a good therapist. <laughs> I will recommend some to you. I, I want us to start with, with the big guys. What is being done to deal with people who are underestimating their own provisional taxes? Because there's a lot of dishonesty out there. What are you doing to go after such people? Clement, it's not just provisional taxes, it's also, and in particular, uh, in your preview I heard you referring to wealthy individuals, yeah. they often have the means to arrange their financial affairs in a way that masks the true nature of their wealth. Very often wealthy people don't earn regular income through a normal employment because they have investments, they buy and they sell assets, um, they earn interest of large investments. And so the nature of their income is often complex. What they do, they then interpose through a structure like a company or a trust uh, or other vehicles, uh, their proceeds, but they are the beneficial owners. Mm -hmm. um, and very often they, they include offshore arrangements. So we need a particular focus on how wealthy people, people with means, um, declare their wealth. And so their income statements often say less than what their balance sheets shows out, and which is more and more yeah. we need to see their balance sheets. In addition, we want to hold practitioners and legal advisors, people who intermediate on behalf of taxpayers, we want to hold them to our highest standard. So when practitioners are non-compliant in their own tax matters, mm. how do you expect them to render a good service to people who rely on them for advice? Yeah. Uh, we mentioned um, law practitioners who should know the law, who should know what they should be declaring as provisional income when they underprovide for that. And the law allows for SARS to then invoke a paragraph in our, in our act 
to then raise the additional. But you have to ask, why would that be necessary? We are saddened by the degree of enabling that takes place, often professional enablers. You know, I often say that at every scene of a state capture crime, there was a bank, or at least one bank. There was a law firm. An there auditor. was expensive consultants. Mm. There were auditors. Mm. How did this happen? And therefore, we believe that those who intermediate and advise must be held to a higher standard, and those who enable crime must be prosecuted as yeah. well. well. What are you picking up through your High Wealth Individuals Unit at SARS? Because I imagine that's what's closely monitoring these, these individuals that are wealthy and trying to underestimate their, their taxes. Yeah, so as I said, this is a more recently established unit. Yeah. And what is important for us, as I mentioned earlier on, is whereas with normal uh, payroll administered employees, Generally, we find our compliance with payroll administered individuals are generally quite high because someone who has a standard income from one employer with basic deductions and maybe earn some interest through a bank hardly have the opportunity to fiddle. But wealthy individuals, as I said, they have various forms of income and they structure, they can appoint advisors and very often advisors then enable Mm. the masking of their true income. And so this unit is focused on looking beyond the uh, income statement to the balance sheet of these individuals, looking beyond assets that are declared in their personal capacity to assets that are held in a vehicle where they are still the beneficial owners. So this division is also intended to provide a one-stop service. Because remember, we have three objectives. We always focus on the third one, which is the enforcement. But our first objective is to help taxpayers understand the obligations, to provide clarity statements, to provide rulings, to provide um, uh, advice before a taxpayer structures their affairs. The second is to make it easy for them. And we appreciate the fact that wealthy individuals are often also busy individuals. So how do we make it easy for them to comply with the law that's one of the purposes of this division. Mm -hmm. But thirdly, also increasingly, through using uh, machine learning algorithms and sophisticated data science to do a more focused yeah. risk profiling and case selection of those individuals who then seek to break the law. What about non-profit organizations and trusts? Because there are some people who use those as vehicles to launder money. So you would have heard me in the results announcement say that just in the past year, we disallowed just more than a billion rand of monies that NPOs claim are donation monies. Let me give you a practical example. Clement decides to create a family trust, makes a donation to the family trust, but actually the trust is used to pay the school fees uh, for Clement's kids at school. Mm. That would be an abuse of a trust. It would not be a donation. It would be a contribution that should go to a recipient in the normal course of events, but is now flowing through a trust. So what we have done is firstly, you will have, we will also be aware that in the normal course of events, we have access to third party data for the assessment of individual taxes. We are working with third party service provi uh, data providers to also bring in uh, a greater declaration of third party data. And secondly, we have um, an organization who works in this space, is registered in terms of Section 18A, and they are then allowed to issue a certificate of donations which a taxpayer can then claim um, that a donation, a legitimate donation has been made. And to put up some defense for illegit illegitimate claims of donations, we are also increasing the reporting requirements yeah. uh, for um, Section 18A organizations. And, and that's important to do, right, especially urgently so, because we've been grey listed. And if we're serious about moving from that list, these are the kind of things you well, need to do. Well, FATF has been very clear mm. that one of the things South Africa would have to do if it wants to come off the grey list is to demonstrate its capability to successfully prosecute crimes of serious tax evasion, 
money laundering, and in particular, the abuse of non-profit organizations specifically used for money laundering and terror finance. If we cannot demonstrate that, we will stay on the grey list no matter what we, we do or how we present our case uh, to the Financial Action Task Force. What's your relationship with law enforcement agencies? Because if you share data amongst each other and you collaborate, surely we can see more successful prosecutions. Clement, yes and no. So we have the law provides very clear frameworks with which allows our agencies to exchange data. And that is working a lot better than what it did five years ago. I have to say that I have a good relationship with my counterparts, uh, Advocate Batoy, um, uh, General Labia. So we have good practical working relationships, but they have the same challenge that I have in SARS, which is we all have capacity constraints. Mm. But the second thing which I think requires a more strategic approach, which is not as effective as it needs to be, is that we play to the same priorities. So if SARS prioritize a particular case as a high profile state capture case, but it's not the same priority for the Hawks or for the NPA, we can complete those cases. For example, we have handed, uh, we have had instances, over 400 instances of that fraud. We've only had 85 cases that has been prosecuted with a prosecution conviction rate of 95%. So very successful, but on a, on only a fraction of That's what we handed over. of the 400. Of, of, well, of, of, of over 800 cases, over but 800 400 cases. specifically on that fraud. Okay. In terms of state capture cases, uh, equally so, uh, we have handed over a significant amount of cases uh, already. We have, in, just in, 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 in our syndicated crime division, we have, in the last five years, um, we have recovered or raised assessment of over uh, almost 120 billion rand. Uh, we've recovered uh, 36 billion rand and we have preserved over 10 billion rands of assets. So then what we do is we hand those cases to the Hawks where we require further investigation and to the NPA who then is the authority that decides how to enroll cases on the court. And sometimes there our collaboration can be better than yeah. what it currently is. What do you think needs to be done for that collaboration to be more strengthened? Because at the end of the day, South Africans want to see these criminals in orange overalls. Is it an, a matter of government capacitating these institutions more or is there more that can be done amongst yourselves in working together? One of the, of the, of the suggestions I would make is that we have a common set of KPIs that we all sign up to. Mm. At the moment, the NPA, the Hawks and SARS each have different KPIs, none of them necessarily aligned to achieve a whole of government approach. But there are also some legacy investments that I have begun to speak more publicly about. For example, um, we would strongly promote the creation of a single unique digital identity for every citizen and for every business in South Africa, for ent every entity. Secondly, a single portal that contains all of the demographic data so that any um, entity, obviously in terms of their mandate, can have access to the same version of the truth. Thirdly, we would say that a common payment platform for every transaction where a client does business with government a common platform be used. And lastly, that we also consolidate the disbursement of monies by the state through a common disbursement platform. At the moment, we have SARS disbursing money, we have SASA disbursing money, we have NSFAS disbursing money, we have the Labor Department disbursing money. Every time, it doesn't only create an opportunity for cost loading, it also creates an opportunity for abuse, for inefficiency and for corruption. Yeah. And in all those institutions you've mentioned, the thieves have always found an opportunity to steal. Well, that's the sad reality uh, that we face. Um, and so for me, I believe to your question, how, we ca how can we succeed? We need the political will and the institutional capability to address some of these big high profile matters as a whole of government approach, as opposed to each agency trying their best according to their narrow uh, priorities rather than a consolidated set of priorities that can successfully bring to book those who have broken the law and have stolen, quite frankly, from South Africa and in particular, the most vulnerable among us. Why don't we have the political 
will that we need, uh, Commissioner. I mean, if, if you look at what the state capture uh, project has done in this country, has done in state institutions, that has been uh, devastating. Why do you think that we don't have that political will that's required? I mean, I don't understand how law enforcement institutions or institutions like SARS, that actually could be a great catalyst um, in effective, having an effective economy that grows, you know, where people are, have actual tax morality and they don't mind paying their taxes. I don't understand why government would not want to capacitate those institutions because they're quite central in the fight against crime, but in also in quite frankly growing the economy. You know, Clement, at one level, you can have a shared vision of what you want to achieve, but execution is hard. And execution is often about doing the basic things right. And again, let me be critical of the way we do things. Yeah. And as a member of government, I'm criticizing myself as well. The way government is organized does not produce the best outcomes if one wants a whole of government approach. So for example, ministries are often siloed according to a narrow mandate. And every minister, every DG wants to do the best to deliver their mandate. Mm. But in doing so often, the, there is the unintended or inadvertent consequence that it sub-optimizes the whole because it's trying to optimize the narrow. And I think that's where I believe it's not just the political will, mm -hmm. but also a hard look at how we organize government in mm -hmm. functional silos as opposed to, you know, let me quote, for example, Singapore has a saying where they say, we have a hundred agencies, but one government. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the hard lessons we have learned from the last 30 years of our democracy, where we have achieved elements of success, but could have achieved much more. Yeah. One of it is a whole of government approach. And what I'm gonna use the next two years for is to advocate yeah. much more uh, that we uh, move towards that. And, and here's the problem, Commissioner, when you don't have political will, when we South Africans don't see people in orange overalls, they start not trusting the state. And when they don't trust the state, they don't trust the state with their taxes, which then affects tax compliance, tax morality, which then becomes your problem because you can't collect as much as government needs for its programs. Well, exactly. So I have been very public when I talk about our success is indivisibly linked to the credibility of the whole of government. Increasingly, for example, if we don't have a successful prosecution, then that does not serve as a deterrent for someone who breaks the tax law. And so what we are saying is increasingly SARS has an interest in how a tax offense is formulated, how a charge is formulated. SARS has an interest, you spoke to the, to the judge president early on. Yeah. If a tax offender gets a rap on the knuckle or just a warning, or a, but there's no serious consequence. And that's again, we have to work as a system and yeah. we currently do not work as effectively as we can and therefore a lot of good work by each of the institutions individually mm. falls through the cracks. And I mean, we have to understand that the whole is gonna be significantly greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. And that for me should be the ambition of the next administration. And consequences might also be about people who come here. You told us the last time um, on the Pala Pala matter that someone arrived here, didn't even declare those sums of money and goes to buy cattle with them cattle at the president's farm. I didn't say that. What did you say? I said, we have no evidence that such that a declaration has been made, yeah. no, that the individual who reported that he had declared the money, we have mm. no evidence that that money was ever declared. Secondly, we reported with the permission of the taxpayer mm. that there is record in their books that a transaction has, been, has taken place and that it was fully disclosed and taxed. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the, the declaration I made. We do not from first hand have evidence of the connection between the one individual who purports that he had brought cash into the country and a transaction that took place later at on. At the farm. 
Yes. But what should there be a consequence on someone who comes to this country? Absolutely, there should be a consequence. What do you do when you find that you have no evidence that the amount has been declared? Do you send them information to the Hawks? What are the consequences? So, so we have a voluntary compliance system. When Clement arrives from London and he has cash on him or he has uh, goods that he had bought, mm. we have a voluntary system that places the obligation on you to make the declaration. We also have a risk profiling so that regular travelers mm -hmm. we will profile and they may then come up on our risk alert system and be pulled aside. What that means in practice is unless we stop every cargo that comes into South Africa mm. and every traveler, yeah. we will miss things and so we are reliant yeah. on taxpayers who of their own volition makes the declaration. Okay. I think last year over six and a half thousand interventions have yielded almost five billion mm -hmm. value of seizures. But again, that barely touches the surface. All right. SARS Commissioner Edward Kisbeta, thank you so much for joining us on Face the Nation tonight. And thanks to you for watching the Tuesday edition of the show. We'll be back on Thursday at 8 p.m. Thanks for watching. Cheers. <laughs>